Welcome to the program, you're with the Rise News in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Ahead over the next 13 minutes, all the global headlines you need to know about. I'm Folake Adesu, but Rise News Now begins. Our top stories, President Trump's signature campaign pledged to build a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border is at stake in a major budget battle. Plus, Amnesty International releases a damning report describing gruesome killings by both herders and farmers in five Nigerian states and accusing the Nigerian government and the army of failing to intervene even when they could. And in business, Dow Jones plunges another 500 points in fourth big decline of December. All right, we begin in the United States, where President Donald Trump's signature campaign pledge to build a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border is at stake in a major budget battle this week. A partial government shutdown is looming on Friday if Congress cannot agree funding for federal agencies. Newly empowered Democrats are refusing White House demands for $5 billion towards constructing such a wall. Mr. Trump said last week he would be proud to shut down his own government if he does not secure the funding. Meanwhile, the White House say President Donald Trump is continuing to negotiate with Congress over funding for the government as a Friday deadline for a resolution looms. Trump is insisting that Congress provide $5 billion to build a border wall despite lawmaker resistance from both parties. Without an agreement, parts of the federal government will shut down at midnight Friday. Speaking to reporters, Trump's director of strategic communications, Mercedes Schlapp, says funding the border wall remains the president's priority. The president's continuing to negotiate with Congress. Obviously, he's looking to have increased funding for border security. That is his priority. And we're going to find ways to get to that $5 billion and make sure that we increase funding not only for the physical barrier, but also for technology and for personnel. You know, he's very focused on getting to that $5 billion number. We'll find ways to get there. I don't have an update on his schedule. I don't have an update on his schedule. Obviously, we don't want to get to a point that we shut down the government, but we got to find increased funding for border security. Well, clearly, uh, we've sanctioned 17 individuals who have been involved in that terrible tragedy of Khashoggi. Uh, we've taken action, and again, we're going to keep following close tabs on it. And Russia used every major social media platform to influence the 2016 U.S. election. New research says YouTube, Tumblr, Instagram, and PayPal, as well as Facebook and Twitter, were leveraged to spread propaganda. The report, released today by the U.S. Senate, exposes the scale of Russian disinformation efforts. The report was put together by University of Oxford's Computational Propaganda Project and the social network analysis firm Grafica. It is the first analysis of millions of social media posts provided Provided by Twitter, Google and Facebook to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Now, the military high command has announced that a wave of U.S. airstrikes in Somalia have wiped out dozens of al-Shabaab militants, Africa's most active Islamist extremist group. The airstrikes have intensified since President Trump took office, with the U.S. military saying that in this latest round of six strikes, it has killed 62 fighters from the Islamist group. It said in a statement that four airstrikes killed 32 militants and a further two killed 28. These were the deadliest air attacks in Somalia since November 2017, when the U.S. said it had killed 100 militants. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has issued a strong statement criticizing and rejecting two U.S. Senate resolutions to end American military support for the war in Yemen and blaming Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Two months after his murder in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Jamal Khashoggi's death continues to raise questions about who was ultimately responsible at the highest level in Saudi Arabia. President Trump's administration have accepted the official Saudi version that the attack was carried out by rogue elements. But there's anger in the U.S. Congress, which voted last week to pull U.S. forces out of the conflict in Yemen. Elsewhere, relatives of a black man shot to death by an Alabama police officer who apparently mistook him for a shooting suspect are complaining about the state's decision to take over the investigation from Birmingham's first black district attorney. The mother of a man take A.J. Bradford Jr., April Pipkin, said that family members feel authorities are trying to protect the officer who fatally shot her son Thanksgiving night in the state's largest shopping mall. All the family wants is for justice to be served for my son, our son. 
And by taking the case from Mr. Carr, we feel they are trying to protect this officer who killed my son. It is deeply disturbing to the family of E.J. Bradford Jr. that the Alabama Attorney General would unilaterally and unnecessarily take the case from D.A. Danny Carr, the first black person elected to this position in Jefferson County. The family has many feel that this could potentially undermine any trust that the black community has in this process. However, we want to make clear that this action subverts the will of the voters and it deters the march towards justice. The AG has the ability to monitor this case very closely. And if DA Carr does anything inappropriately, he could then take action. But at least give DA Carr, who was elected by the people in an overwhelming number of votes, to do the job of delivering justice in Jefferson County. If every time we use the excuse that it may affect other cases the police officers are working on, if they kill an unarmed person or they kill a person in highly questionable circumstances that the elected DA can't do his job, then it sets a terrible precedence, a very terrible precedence. I mean, he's barely been on the job to take this away from him now is sending a message to the citizens of Jefferson County. Well, in Europe, the British Prime Minister Theresa May has announced that a key Brexit vote will be held in Parliament in early January. The vote has been delayed to allow Mrs May to try to renegotiate elements of the deal with the EU which are unpopular with British MPs. The Prime Minister made her statement after returning from Brussels without securing any amendments to the agreement. In these conclusions, in their statements at the Council and in their private meetings with me, my fellow EU leaders could not have been clearer. They do not want to use this backstop. They want to agree the best possible future relationship with us. There is no plot to keep us in the backstop. Indeed, President Macron said on Friday, quote, we can clarify and reassure. The backstop is not our objective. It is not a durable solution, and nobody is trying to lock the UK into the backstop. As formal conclusions from a European Council, these commitments have legal status and should be welcomed. They go further than the EU has ever done previously in trying to address the concerns of this House. And of course, they sit on top of the commitments that we have already negotiated in relation to the backstop, including ensuring the customs element is UK-wide, that both sides are legally committed to using best endeavours to have our new relationship in place before the end of the implementation period, that if the new relationship isn't ready, we can choose to extend the implementation period instead of the backstop coming into force, that if the backstop does come in, we can use alternative arrangements, not just the future relationship to get out of it, that the treaty is clear the backstop can only ever be temporary, and that there is an explicit termination clause. But, Mr Speaker, I know that this House is still deeply uncomfortable about the backstop, and I understand that, and I want to secure to us to go further still in the reassurances we secure. And so the heated conversation continues in the UK House there. Well, in response to May's statement to British lawmakers, British opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn accused Prime Minister Theresa May of having run down the clock on Brexit by announcing that lawmakers will have to wait until the week of the 14th of January to vote on her deal with the EU. Mr Speaker, we face an unprecedented situation. The Prime Minister has led us into a national crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And if any more evidence was needed of why we face this grave situation, the Prime Minister demonstrated it last week's summit. There were some warm words drafted, and the Prime Minister even managed to negotiate those away to be replaced by words about preparing for no deal. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister boasted, I had a robust discussion with President Juncker. But that cannot hide the cold reality that she achieved nothing. Yeah. Yeah.
Standing at the dispatch box last week, the Prime Minister said, I have made some progress. Mr Speaker, she has not made any progress at all. The Prime Minister said so herself while still in Brussels, and I quote, The EU is clear, as am I, that this is the deal. The European Commission has been categorical. It will not be renegotiated. The EU Council has given the clarification that were possible at this stage, so no further meetings with the UK are foreseen. The deal is unchanged and not going to change. The House must get on with the vote and move on to consider the realistic alternatives. Well, there you have it there for now. Well, time for a short break now, but do stay with us. Plenty more still ahead on Arise News Now. Nigeria. We are 198 million productive people with over 900,000 square kilometers of fertile land. Nigeria's banking system has emerged strong and resilient from the 2016 crisis, which has enhanced our productivity in agribusiness and manufacturing. Come, invest in Nigeria's agribusiness, manufacturing and value-added mining. Enjoy the Central Bank of Nigeria-led initiatives in funding interventions, stabilized exchange rate, friendly capital repatriation regime, and many more. The Central Bank of Nigeria's robust monetary policy and interventions under President Buhari's administration and positioned the economy to target and attain a GDP growth of 6% with a strong and growing external reserves. Come, invest in Nigeria. Nigeria, ready for business. As a fashion writer, I know how quickly trends are created and changed. In business, it's no different. To stay ahead, I needed a plan flexible enough to meet my changing communication needs. More Business 2.0 didn't just give me voice and data in one package. I got a whole lot more. With more business, setting up my website was no problem. But I'm not just a fashion writer. I also own a home decor store before I decided to open an accessory store. With my customized more business plan, managing my staff's communication is easy. No matter how frequently they come, oh, they go. With Nine Mobile's new online self service this week, I could adapt my plans to include this. From 2000 Naira, choose a business bundle. Customize your staff's voice and data lines and enjoy a variety of add-on business services. Dial star 200 star 5 hash now to subscribe. More business. Welcome back to Rise News Now. We're live from Nigeria's capital, Abuja. I'm Folake Adesuba. Now, here in Nigeria, where Amnesty International has accused the Nigerian authorities of foiling a conflict between farmers and herders by failing to investigate and persecute those carrying out the violence. Their report describes gruesome killings by both farmers and cattle herders in Adamawa, Benue, Taraba, Kaduna, and Plateau states. It accuses the Nigerian government of gross incompetence by failing to persecute those behind the violence, which Amnesty says has killed more than 3,500 people since 2016. The riots groups report documents, instances where the military, despite being positioned to close the violence, failed to intervene. The report has prompted a furious response from the army, which accuses Amnesty of trying to destabilize the country and has called for its officers to be closed down. And at least 12 Nigerian soldiers are reported to have been killed and dozens of others are missing after fighting with Islamist militants in the northeastern state of Borno. It's one of the largest known losses of life by the army in the last month. However, an army spokesman said that the death toll stated by military sources, who is cited by the Reuters news agency, was not true. The fighting followed an attack at the weekend by insurgents in Gudumbani local government area, a part of Borno State where a Boko Haram breakaway group known as Islamic State in West Africa, or ISWAP, is influential. Now, while the attacks were going on, President Buhari was in a meeting with his regional counterparts trying to sort out the serious security headache created by Boko Haram. 
Another crisis news, fighting has continued between Shaiti rebels and forces loyal to Yemen's internationally recognized government, despite a ceasefire agreed in Sweden last week. The fighting left at least 12 people dead and 25 others wounded from both sides at the strategic Red Sea port of Hodeida. The port handles about 70% of Yemen's food aid and other imports coming into the country. The ceasefire is expected to go into effect on Tuesday. And soldiers and police in Indian-controlled Kashmir are enforcing a security lockdown for a second straight day to stop anti-India protests and foil a call by separatists for a march towards India's main military garrison in a disputed region. Government forces patrolled streets in the region's main city of Srinagar and sold off all the roads leading to India's military garrison in the city. Three Kashmiri leaders known as the Joint Resistance Leadership called for Kashmiris to march to the army barracks to protest the killings of seven civilians and three rebels during an Indian counterinsurgency operation over the weekend. Looking into business news now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average in New York plunged 500 points, its second straight drop of that size, and its fourth big decline this month. Longtime market favorites like Microsoft and Amazon took heavy losses on Monday, while healthcare companies also fell sharply. A measure of small company stocks fell into a bear market, a decline of 20% below their recent peak. The market is now well into the red for the year, and the S&P 500 index is trading at its lowest level since October 2017. Another day of very bad losses. There wasn't any specific piece of news that really set this off. But uh, the Federal Reserve is meeting in a couple of days, and people aren't sure what kind of signals they're going to give about the economy. And uh, given all the concerns investors have had lately about global growth, uh, nobody was willing to take a chance and send things higher. Uh, right now, the big fear is that economic growth around the world is slowing down. There's been a lot of news out of China and out of Europe and Japan and other regions uh, that say the global economy is slowing. The U.S. is expected to slow down this year, uh, next year from this year. Um, and people are wondering how bad that slowdown is going to be. Right now, people are concerned it's going to be much worse than anything they had counted on, uh, even though there's not really a lot of data to back that up. It looks like the U.S. economy in particular should be okay next year. The Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ are all in a correction right now. They've all fallen at least 10% since they set their most recent records. Uh, for the S&P, it's down about 13% in the last three months. Uh, the Dow, it's a little bit less, but it peaked in uh, early October. October. A federal judge ruled over the weekend that the 2010 Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. So there were big losses for some hospital operators, uh, some health plan administrators and insurers today. I think the consensus is that that ruling is probably going to be thrown out. But uh, with this much uncertainty and this much fear in the market, people weren't going to take a chance. So those companies did notably badly today. In other business developments, Renault has requested a full Nissan shareholder meeting, appearing to escalate the carmaker's standoff with its Japanese alliance partner in the wake of the pace scandal engulfing chairman and CEO Carlos Ghosn. It's understood Thierry Bellore, the French group's deputy CEO, issued the demand in a letter to Nissan. Ghosn's arrest in Japan for alleged financial misconduct has shaken the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance, with Nissan CEO Hiroto Saikawa calling for changes to weaken Renault's control. Renault owns 43.4% of Nissan, whose reciprocal 15% stake in its French parent carries no voting rights. Nissan in turn controls Mitsubishi via a 34% holding. And Italy's coalition government has agreed on the numbers and contents of the budget it will propose to Brussels in a bid to avoid disciplinary action over its plans to raise deficit spending next year. The European Commission rejected the Italian budget in October, estimating it would not lower the country's huge debt and declaring it in blatant breach of the EU fiscal rules. Rome submitted the revised plan last week with a lower deficit. But a final deal with Brussels had yet to be reached. Time is running out to finalise the 2019 budget law, which must be passed by the end of the year. 
and Malaysia has filed criminal charges against investment bank Goldman Sachs and two former employees in connection with a corruption and money laundering probe at the country's investment fund 1MDB. It has been investigated in at least six countries. Goldman Sachs called the charges misdirected and said it would vigorously defend them. We're headed for a short break now, but do stay with us. Sports and entertainment are right up next in our Ice News Now. There's an old saying in Nigeria, thoughts and dreams are the foundation of our being. At First Bank, we dare to dream and strive to innovate, continuing our over 120-year tradition to be the first to offer new products and services to our customers. You first. First Bank. Welcome back to Rise News Now. We're live from Nigeria's capital, Abuja. I'm Falake Adesuba. Now let's have a look at the world of entertainment now. The iconic singer Kate Bush, who turned 60 this year, is marking the milestone with a book that will chart her remarkable career. Described as one of the greatest lyricists of all time, Kate Bush's music is reputed for its lyrical dexterity and unique mastery of ima imagery and allegory. Her new book titled How to Be Invisible is a collection of song lyrics from selected songs stretching from her very first single to her 10th studio album, with an introduction written by Cloud Atlas author David Mitchell. The book displays the extent of Kate Bush's undisputed writing talent and her unique ability for self-expression. While she's continued... I hated you, I loved you too. And it was another great weekend for American pop star Ariana Grande and all the good news came from across the Atlantic and Britain. The petite songstress hit the number one spot in the UK music charts, putting her in the race for the highly coveted Christmas number one title. In addition, it was also announced that Ariana would be returning to Manchester as part of her world tour next year. This will mark two years since the terrorist bombing at her last tour in Manchester, which killed 22 people. Ariana posted a message on Instagram to confirm the news as she said, and I quote, we are of course coming and we love you. The British leg of her tour will also visit Birmingham, Glasgow and London. And in Latin America, there is definitely something special about Jennifer Lopez's glow. If there's one word that describes Jennifer Lopez, it's overachiever. The multi-hyphenate has an awe-inspiring roster of projects, and frankly, we're fans of every single one. But in between performing in Las Vegas and executive producing and starring in movies, there's one thing Lopez has yet to find time for, crafting her own skincare line. Well, next year, that's going to change. Lopez announced on Thursday that she's been working on her own skincare collection. The announcement came in response to a question about Lopez's own skincare regimen. Now we can get the JLo glow in a bottle. Well, that's it for this edition of Arise News Now. Thank you for being a part of the program. Do stay with us on the channel. I'm Falake Adesuba from the whole team here in Abuja and London. That's goodbye for now. <laughs>